The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Jesus went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. He was talking to one of the friends of his, and he's known for a good number of years when he was teaching. And I said, well, how's he doing? And he said, well, you know, he's got bad knees, and he's talking about the trouble he's having with that. And I said, I thought he had neuropathy. Yeah, oh, he's got that too, but, you know, it's kind of dealing with it. And he asked me how I was, and I told him, well, you know, stuff that was going on with me and all of that. Then I said, well, you know, my brother, I talked to him, and he was talking about his diabetes and high blood pressure, and he asked me how I was doing, and I talked about them all. And I came to the realization that nobody really cares about these conversations but old people, because you know what I mean? <laughs> Because <laughs> we can identify with all these things. Young people, what are you talking about then? Now, if you're wondering what that's got to do with the sermon, absolutely nothing. I just thought of it, and I thought I'd share it with you. <clears throat> One of the things that Daryl also did talk to me about, and this does have to do with the sermon, is he asked me to spend some time talking about covenant and talking also about covenant and about prophets. Both are relevant for today. And to begin with, I'd like to take you back to the very first week of Lent when Father Art spent a great deal of time talking about a covenant and what it was and the important thing, one of the important things to remember as, as a product of that covenant that God made with us and renewed periodically throughout the Old and now the New Testament is that God said, I will always 
always be faithful. Even if you're not, I will always be faithful. And that is an important thing to remember. Many saw Jesus as a prophet, not as a Messiah. Today, many people see Jesus as a prophet, but not the Messiah. We look at Jesus as being a prophet and a Messiah. So let's go back to the Old Testament first, Jeremiah. Take a look at him. Jeremiah, an interesting, wonderful, prolific man, wrote all kinds of important things, including poetry, essays. He wrote um, his sermons and wrote down some of the things that were important. Now, if I'm going to give you one word to think of, or two words, what, what, a, what a prophet would be, think of as a moral compass. They really are there to keep pointing us periodically in the right direction. That's what prophets do. Sometimes they look to the past and say, this is where we are because of that, and you need to be aware of the past. Sometimes this is where we're going. Well, Jeremiah did all of that. And his ministry lasted about 40 years. And somewhere in here, um, he received word from God that I want you to write down everything that you have done and save it for posterity. So he hired a guy by the name of Baruch. And Baruch wrote everything down. So what we have with Jeremiah is a collection of collections. So there's a lot of stuff that goes mingling in there. His main, it's divided into three different sections, and this is the last of the three sections. But in part, initially, he warns Judah. You gotta stop it. This is what's going. You had this covenant with God, You've had this arrangement. You know God's always going to be faithful, but your part is also to be faithful to that covenant. Well, in Jerusalem, in the temple, people were going to the temple and praying to Yahweh. But when they come out, there had been a heavy Canaanite influence, and these folks were actually pagans. And one of the things they believed in, one sect of this believed in children being sacrificed. I don't get that. It just sounds so weird and so odd. But the Jews began to practice some of these kind of to hedge their bets. And with that, Jeremiah warns against that. that that's not really, or what's going to happen is there's going to be a big war. You're going to lose. And you're going to be taken, we're going to be taken into captivity and be held in captivity by Babylon for like 70 years. Promises that. And it comes to pass. He was so unpopular that at one point, Jeremiah got kidnapped and sold as a slave in Egypt. And with that, he continued to prophesy. The moral compass now goes back in this section for today, where he reminds Israel and Judah, God still loves you. Cannot help it. God loves you. God will always remain faithful. Remember that goes all the way back to Moses and to Abram. I will always be faithful, no matter what. Doesn't mean God likes what we do. Doesn't mean God approves, but God loves us. So now we go to the gospel. In John's gospel, Lazarus has already been raised from the dead. So we're near, remember we hear that the Jews are coming up, we have Greeks are coming up for the festival, Passover, they're coming for Passover. So Jesus knows that the time of his death is coming to a, coming to a very close, it's about ready to happen. So we have some Greek speaking Jews, they're Jews, they're not Gentiles, who come to see Jesus. And all of a sudden they're here, but what? they're gone. Don't know what happened with that. So Jesus really takes a look at his moral and earthly compass. Remember way back, I, in one of the sermons I preached earlier during Lent, I said to you that Jesus' humanity and divinity were not always comfortable with each other. At times they were in conflict just like us. Sometimes we struggle with doing or even knowing what the right thing is. So this is one of those times when Jesus' moral start, he starts thinking, reflecting back. The Good Friday is coming. 
coming. This is the last week before Palm Sunday. So we're about to draw our own Palm Sunday death and resurrection of Jesus coming very soon. So with that, he reflects back another question with, what about this? I don't know. The time is coming. Do I want this hour? But it's for this hour that I came. No, your will be done. And so he resolves that. Not done with that yet. That's going to come again. But looking at that, recognizing that if we truly believe that we are made in the image and the likeness of God, then there are times when we're okay with our humanity and our divinity, and sometimes they're in conflict. We call that a conscience. And then also we now come to the letter to the Hebrews. It's not a letter. It's a sermon. And for many, many years, when I was younger, we thought Paul wrote that. Well, he didn't. Um, they don't know really who wrote it. But it's written to converts to, the Christ to Christianity. And it's meant to give them, coming from a whole different tradition, waiting for a Messiah, and now what about that? Speaking about Jesus and his relationship to God and his relationship to us. Speaking about God, this Christ who is here, was not something that he hoped for. This was not his goal, not something he grasped at, but it was something that was offered to him and or something that he, as God's son, made the decision to follow through. And with that, humanity has come to say yes. Okay. Now, putting that all together, I think was really important because I look in terms of a prophet, and one of the questions we ask is, well, that moral compass, is that that's all in the past, right? No, no, no. We have many prophets that are still being raised who challenge our moral compass. One of them is called clergy. We who are clergy do our best to study what the will of God is and to point that direction. <laughs> to try to say this is the way that we need to go. To try to be clearer with what God wishes for us. That's, what, that's what's one. But also, we've got other people. Mar Martin Luther King, Jr. Gandhi. Mother Teresa, one of my favorites, I did a paper on her, was Joan of Arc. Uh, I'll never forget it. I just, I, the more I read about her, the more impressed I was. She was a teenager, young teenager, and she had uh, started, she was on her way to see her uncle, a duke. And on the way, she started hearing voices. And the voices told her to go to her uncle and tell him to take her to the king, who was in exile at that time, and have him put her in charge of an army, and she would get him crowned king. Her uncle said, okay. <laughs> Took her to the king. And the king said, okay. Put her in charge of an army, and lo and behold, got him crowned king of France. Yay! But, there's always a but. She became inconvenient to the state. So what did the state do? Did they correct their moral compass? Nope. They said, got to be a witch. So they convicted, they tried her, convicted her, and had her burned at the stake as a witch all by the age of 19. I, I just fascinated. Later to become declared a saint by the Catholic Church. And indeed, a powerful witch. That's a, and a lot of our prophets have had that happen to them, but not all, because we have Mother Teresa giving people dignity and death. We also have Dorothy Day. We also have people in this congregation called Mom and Dad. Mom and Dad become the moral compass for their children. Years ago, when I was a young priest, uh, we had a, one of the churches I had, we had a, a retreat for the parish. I, there, actually, there were three small churches, and we had one retreat, and there was a woman I'd gotten to know, whose name escapes me at the moment. Uh, she came in and led this retreat for us. Absolutely phenomenal, just a beautiful human being, and gifted in many ways, excellent preacher, moving, brought us all so, closer, so much closer to God. Last night, the very last night, and she pulls me to one side, and she says, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah. 
And she said, I've got to go to Superior. No, Duluth. Got to go to Duluth. A family that she knew very, very well, when she had left to do this retreat, the wife was pregnant and very near her time. Well, the baby got delivered. But the baby was born with the organs on the outside of the body. And the child was going to die. And she was asked by the dad to come up. So she drove from Hagen, Wisconsin, up to Superior all that time. What can I say? What can I do? I can't make this better. What can I do? What can I say? I don't know. And she drove all that way. So she gets to the hospital. She starts walking in. And she goes up to where the dad is with the baby. And she couldn't see the dad because he, he, was, he was facing this direction. She was behind. And all he could see was his head bent over and he's doing this. And she approached him, put her hand on his shoulder, and then looked at him. And as she looked, he was smiling. Oh, yeah, there were tears. But she was smiling. And she said, he said, you just got to love him, don't you? You just got to love her. Look at her. You just have to love her. And that, to me, said the way God looks at us. Sometime God, throughout the course of the beginning of the promise, of God's promise, I will always be faithful. I will always love you. I think God looks at us and says, what are they doing? I don't get it. I don't understand what they do to each other sometimes, how they hurt each other. But I can't stop loving them. It's just impossible. Because we are made in the image and likeness of God, just like you when you make your children. You don't love them for what they do. You love them simply because they are. That doesn't mean you approve or like everything they've done. But you can't stop loving them. That's a gift of this season. Amen. Mm -hmm.